And please stand with me for the reading of the word of God. And the passage that we're in today is Joshua 23. A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years, Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders and heads, its judges and officers, and said to them, I am now old and well well advanced in years, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake, for it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. Behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes those nations that remain, along with all the nations that I have already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. The Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight, and you shall possess their land. Just as the Lord your God promised you, therefore be very strong and keep, um, to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor to the left, that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you, or make mention of the names of their gods, or swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them. But you shall cling to the Lord your God, just as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations, and as for you, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One man of you puts to flight a thousand, since it is the Lord your God who fights for you, just as he promised you. Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. But they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good ground that the Lord your God has given you. And now I am about to go the way of all the earth. And you, you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. But just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off this good land that the Lord your God has given you if you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and you shall perish quickly from off the good land that he has given you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Tiffany. Go ahead and have your seats. Good morning. Good to see you all. My name is Josh. If I don't know you, I have the pleasure of being on staff here and uh, looking forward to opening the word this morning. We're going to continue on in our study through the book of Joshua, this series we've been calling Strong and Courageous. As you just heard, we're going to be in chapter 23. Uh, What we're going to be reading this morning, this is Joshua's farewell address to the people of Israel, the farewell address, and in it he extends three charges that we're going to take a look at in order to prepare and and really set the people up well for the season coming without him and as they step forward into the promise of God put before them. I've really enjoyed my time studying the word this morning, or this week, pardon me. Um, There's lots in here for us. There's way more than a history lesson. Uh, We too are stepping forward into promises that God has for us. So there's great application. I'm looking forward to it. Go ahead, grab your Bibles, open up. And while you do that, let me open us in a word of prayer. Uh, Father, I thank you uh, just for this great story of you delivering people. You're our deliverer as well. Thank you that you've given us your word to strengthen and encourage us in our season as well. I pray this morning, Holy Spirit, as I open the word and really just walk through what you've impressed on my heart this week, that you would empower me. This is nothing without you. All of us, we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. So I pray that you would minister to us, strengthen us, and um, I'm dependent on you for this Holy Spirit. And it's in the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. So as we just heard Tiffany read, the text opens by saying Joshua is advanced in years. He's advanced in years, a polite way of saying he's old. 
Um, it says this, if you've tracked with, with the story of the Old Testament, back in Numbers 13, we saw Joshua first pop on the scene when, when Moses sent him and Aaron and 10 other spies into the land. Now, he, at that time, he was about my age, somewhere in the 30 to 40-year-old range. No one really knows. He won't tell. Um, but you remember, they went in, they spied out the land. Joshua and Caleb came back with, with a great report, but the 10 others didn't. So as a result, they spent 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years, so 30 to 40 plus 40 by the time that Joshua leads them across the Jordan and we see the walls of Jericho topple at the beginning of our, our, of, our, of our work through the book of Joshua. But then the text says that a long time afterward, meaning a big period of time has passed since then and I've done the math in here, it turns out it's about 30 years. So regardless of what metric you're using to determine when you can begin to call someone old, Joshua meets it. He's about 110, 110 years old. And so he calls together the people of Israel because he's probably figuring my end's probably coming pretty soon and I should prepare. He, he pulls them together and he gives a speech. And he does this because just as a, he knows, just as a relay race is not run by the strength of one runner, it's many in succession and the, the baton pass counts a lot, he's trying to set them up for the next season ahead. And he calls them together with some instruction. This right here, it cracks open a big theme in the Bible. Um, one that I actually spent a fair amount of time on in my study this week, that of heritage, that of legacy, that of long-term linear planning and thinking. It turns out that uh, there's actually many, many, many speeches in the Bible, final speeches that people give. Just about every Bible character gives a final speech. If you're looking for a fun topical study this week, I'd commend that. Really interesting. You can go back and trace all of the patriarchs and so forth. But one of them, very notable and applicable to our text this morning, is Moses' last speech. And that's in Deuteronomy 31. So I want to invite you just to take a bit of a left in your Bible with me. Deuteronomy 31, I want to read a couple verses. It says, Moses continued to speak these words to all Israel, and he said to them, I'm 120 years old today. I'm no longer able to go out and come in. The Lord said to me, you shall not go over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you so that you will dispossess them. And Joshua will go over at your head as the Lord has spoken. And the Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and to their land when he destroyed them. And the Lord will give them over to you, and you shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I've commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Don't fear or be in dread of them, for it's the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. And so Moses summoned Joshua and said to him, In all the sight of Israel, be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord your God has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It's the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Now, if you've been with us throughout this series, you might recognize some of this language. Um, you recognize some of this language in Joshua's speech, but there's this language laced through the whole book of Joshua. And it's not just because Josh is making use of the lack of anti-plagiarism laws at the time. What he's doing is he's passing on some of the gold nuggets, the wisdom that's been deposited into him. He's thinking not just about his own legacy. He's thinking about the nation's longevity. He's not just thinking about his own legacy. He's thinking about the good of the nation in the years to come. And this concept, this linear thinking, it challenged me. It, it challenged me, and actually, I dove pretty deep down the rabbit hole in my study this week. It got boring, uh, I won't lie to you, but there's some goodness and there's some not boring stuff here I want to share with you, a couple scriptures. Um, Psalm 71, the psalmist says, God, don't forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation. Don't forsake me until I proclaim your power to all those to come. 
we see this heart of linear, long-term thinking. In Proverbs 13, uh, 22, it praises this type of thinking and, and says, a, a wise man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, not just a financial one, a, a legacy for them to live in. And the reason the Bible praises this long-term generational thinking is because the Bible actually commands it. In Proverbs 22, 6, it says, train a child up in the way they should go and in the end they won't depart from it. In Deuteronomy 4 and 6, we read um, God commanding that all that God has done and all that God has commanded be instructed and passed on to the next generation. The Bible cares about this and this is why it praises it. But what really stuck out to me as I, as I studied this topic this week is how as Christians, we actually have, we have more reason to think generationally than any other people on the face of the earth. The reason I say that is because the promises that God has extended to us are not just to us, but to all the generations that would come afterwards. And additionally, the mission that God calls us into, that of spreading his fame, um, letting the nations hear his name, spreading the gospel to every nook and cranny, every unreached people group in the world, is going to require long-term thinking and strat strategical planning if we're going to accomplish it. We have more reason to think, and this doesn't mean we do this, but we have more reason to than any other people in the world. And this is why... I love Westside. This is why, I, as a church here, we, we do a number of things. We, we sponsor missionaries overseas, but we also sponsor missionaries on UBC and SFU and all of our local college campuses because the next generation matters. This is why we strive to do excellent children's ministry because the next generation matters. It's why we should all have lots of kids. Uh, they're a lot of fun to make. I mean, a lot of fun to have. <laughs> but they are also our plan for the future. We need to embed them in community and we need to train them. Um, Proverbs 127.4. This is a great one to write down. Proverbs 127.4. It says, like arrows in the hands of a warrior, the children of one's youth. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of one's youth. And the reason why is that you and I, we're all going to have battles that we're going to fight in our lifetime. We have battles, we have things that we need to do, but there's a battle coming and our children are like arrows that we hurdle over our battles and into the future. And so we need to invest and we need to think long term. They are the future change agents. How we live matters but it matters just as much how well we set up the generation to come. Um, many ways that I was challenged with, with this as I studied this week, but just to extend some of the challenge onto all of us as a, as a community, I wanna, I wanna ask, how are we as individuals thinking and planning for the generations to come? Are we thinking, are we planning, maybe even, how are we serving the generations to come? Don't need to dive into that much more now, but maybe that's a good lunch discussion. I don't know. I think Josh was pondering questions like this when he called the nation together, when he summoned the people. He knows he's leaving. He wants to prepare them for what's ahead. The people, they've, they've entered into the promised land, but they haven't taken full possession of it yet. There's still promises of God to be fulfilled, and so his instruction... It's pertinent because it prepares them for this season of something already having begun but not yet being fully realized that they find themselves in. And what's interesting is that you and I are in a very similar period. We're in a period of waiting, an in-between time, where we're waiting for the full realization of what's ahead. It's begun for us, but it's not fully here. Just as Joshua um, led the people into a land of abundance. Jesus has come in order to lead us into a life of abundance. I got a verse, it's up on the screen, John 10.10. 10. This is Jesus speaking. It's one of my favorites. Um, he says, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. 
This is why Jesus came. He came that we would have life abundantly. Now, before anyone throws a rock at me, what I'm not saying, what I'm not preaching is the prosperity gospel here. This is not saying that Jesus came so our life would be abundantly full of stuff or abundantly full of health or abundantly full of wealth. It's not speaking to the quantity of things in our life. It's talking about the quality of actual life that we're living. This is what it's speaking to. And if you want to get a little nerdy with the Greek, I've got a couple words up on the screen um, out of John 10.10. 10. The word life there that Jesus came to give us, said he came to give us, is the Greek word zoe. Zoe, um, really interesting word um, to make long story short. It's referring to the quality of life that Jesus has within himself. The quality of life that he had within the, his triune relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. The quality of life that he had when he came to earth. It says that he came to give us zoe and zoe more abundantly. Now that word abundantly is the Greek word parasos, and it's referring um, to something being exceedingly abundant, expanding, overflowing, really an extraordinary quality of life. Now the problem for all of us is even if we believe this, even if we believe Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly, most of us have put this off as some future thing to be realized. Some thing that one day when we die, we'll take possession of. Some far off esoteric idea. And, and it's true, we won't fully partake of this until Christ returns or, or we die and get to go be in glory. But what's not true, this is what we need to guard against, what's not true is that we don't begin to participate in it now. In um, John 17, three, Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they know you. This is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. So Jesus came, he died in order to reconcile us to relationship with the Father and to give us life, and he says that begins now. He's died, he's made that relationship. Eternal life is knowing God, and that access is open to us now. So in the words of John Ortberg, Eternity is now in session. Eternal life has begun for us. As Joshua begins to lay out these three challenges, reminders, or charges, whatever we'll call them, we need to see that they're pertinent to us today as well because there is some, just as there was something threatening the possession of the promised land for the people of Israel, there is something that is threatening our participation in this life that Jesus came to give us. There's things that we'll try to get in the way of it. The same things that threaten Israel's in-between season threaten our season as well. Now before we go into these three points, I want to I wanna ask us, have we, you know, just, just honestly to yourself, you need to answer out loud, have you tasted this life? Have you tasted this life Jesus came to give? Let me ask you then this next question. One person has, thank you. Is that Matt? Matt's tasted it. Um, do you know what's threatening your participation in it? There's something there. Um, Song of Solomon 2.15, it talks about little foxes that sneak in and destroy the vineyard. Um, it's analogous, this verse, but most of us, we have fences against the large livestock that might wander in, but it warns of the little foxes that sneak through the hole in the fence and the threat that they bring that we can sometimes miss. The question I'm asking is, what are the little foxes for you? What are the things that threaten your participation in this life that Jesus has come to give? Now, in order that the nation be encouraged to take hold of the promised land God's given them, and in order that we might fully engage in the promised life Jesus has for us, Joshua gives now three, three charges. The first, it's in verse 3. It's to reflect on God's past faithfulness. He says, you've seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake, for it's the Lord your God who has fought for you. He hammers on this over and over. 13 times in 14 verses, he attributes all that's been done back to the Lord your God. It's 
Lord your God it appears all through there. You have seen it, he's saying. He's reminding them. I don't know if you've been tracking um, with the Christian news this last month. Lots of sad stories have been coming through. Um, there have been several, several news stories about prominent pastors, worship leaders, believers who have walked away from their faith. Leaving disgruntled, doubting even the existence of God in some cases. Very sad stories to read. Very heavy stories to read. And um, in, in many instances, I think in, in many ways, these, these stories, they remind me of marriages that I've seen that have dissolved. Formerly, um, seemingly, great relationships. Um, some of them, I was, I was at their ceremonies. I saw, I knew them for years. I, I've seen their vows. And then a few years in, Something's happened, they've, they've been pulled apart or quote unquote, they've fallen out of love. Joshua's reminder to them, it, it's to remember all that God has been to them. All the ways they've seen him act. All the mountaintop moments they've had. He's pulling out the memory box. He's pulling up the last five years of Instagram feeds. He's, he's trying to remind them of everything that's happened before. He wants to cause them to recollect, to reflect on who God's been. Little foxes, they'll sneak into marriages. They're going to sneak into our relationship with the Lord as well. And when they do, we need to remind ourselves of all that God has done. All that's happened before. We need to be ready with an account of all the ways that God's moved for us. And there's a few ways we can do this. Let me get to this in a second. But What we see Josh doing here in many verses is reminding them of the God who sent the plagues, who delivered them out of Egypt, who split the Red Sea, who made water come out of a rock, who sent bread from heaven, who sent quail from heaven, who split the Jordan, who conquered nations before them. He wants them to see all who God, all the ways God has moved for them in time past, and, and we need to see this as well. So as a practice, a way that we can practically put this on. I want to commend something to you. In your time this week, while you're praying, um, could I encourage you, take, take a little longer. Go for a prayer walk. If, if you're a prayer walking type, maybe you have a prayer closet, go into your prayer closet. And as you open up in your time of prayer, just begin by recounting all the things that you've seen God do. Go back through. Spend some time there. If you spend your whole time there, that's okay. This is a great way to begin. If you, if you pray through different prayer models, if you've been taught different ways to pray, one of the ones I like, um, the acronym ACTS, beginning with adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. So you begin your prayer, and the Lord's Prayer begins this way too, just by acknowledging who God is, all that he's done. But this week, could I commend to us all, Westside, a practice of just lingering over who God's been for us. Reflecting on that. Because it'll guard us against these little foxes that will come. He says, Don't forget who God, that, or don't, pardon me, don't forget how God has fought for you. But then he moves on to his second point, which is remember God's future promises towards them. In verse 4, we'll pick it up. Behold, I've allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes those nations that remain, along with all the nations that I've already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. The Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight, and you shall possess their land just as the Lord your God promised you. So he said, everything that God has done, he's promised to do, he's already done. Now he's reminding them of what God has promised to yet do. He's pointing to the character of God and saying, he's faithful, he's going to do it. Now don't forget what he's promised will yet come. But as we go through the middle chapters of our lives, the, these sections of something already having begun but not quite there yet, it's very easy, isn't it, to look over at alternate storylines and go, I think it would be better to be over there. I think I want to be over there. That looks a little bit more enjoyable. That looks a little bit more pleasurable. That looks like a better time. He's saying those seasons are going to come. Don't look at your middle chapter, look at the chapter to come. Look at what God's promised. 
if we fix our eyes on that, we're going to be more equipped to fight these temptations that come along in our middle chapters. He's urging them, remember what God has said is coming. In verse 5, um, he's quoting Deuteronomy 9, where God promised that he would fully deliver the land over to them. He doesn't want them to settle for half the land. This is what they've got. They haven't fully taken possession of what God's given. They're still lingering enemies. He wants them to possess all that God has for them. And Westside, there is promises of God ahead for us as well. And we cannot forget them. And I want to fully partake of all that God has for me. I want all of it. I want that for us as a body. I want all that God has for Westside in the city. Life abundant. Life zoe. Life as Christ has it. Life overflowing. This is why Jesus says in John 6 that he's the bread of life. Whoever comes to him will not hunger. Whoever believes in him will never thirst. That's why Jesus promised in, in John 14, or 414, pardon me, that whoever drinks of the water that he'll give him will never be thirsty again. The water that he gives will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Man, I want that. I want all of that. I want all of that for us. He promises life abundant. And he also promises life eternal. In 1 John 2, 24, this is up on the screen. He says, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise he's made to us, eternal life. He promises eternal life, new heavens, new earth, where we get to live our lives out free from sin and its effects. He promises that we'll, we'll, we'll be given crowns, that he will give He'll share his glory with us for all eternity. I want that for us. I want that for myself. I want this for the city. But if you're like me, there's a temptation that comes along. It tries to lure us into cheap bootleg versions, right? Hack job counterfeits. We, we're prone to satisfy ourselves on life acceptable rather than life abundant. We're like a family headed to Disneyland. And along the way on this road trip, they decide to, to, to pull off and take some detours and see all of the cheap roadside small town attractions. And instead of getting to Disneyland, they get to see the Hoover Dam and the world's largest ball of twine. I don't know, I don't know what it is that detours you, but there's something. It's worth examining. There's eternal life in store for us, life abundant, and many of us, if you were like me, we've been settling for life acceptable. So after reminding them of God's future promise, all that he's done, he goes on to his third point, the third charge he gives them, and in turn us, is to devote themselves to God. Read with me verse 6. He says, therefore, be very strong to keep and do all that's written in the book of the law turning aside from it neither to the right nor to the left, that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you or make mention of the names of their gods or swear by them or serve them or bow down to them. But you shall cling to the Lord your God just as you've done to this day. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations. And as for you, no man has been able to stand before you. One man of you puts to flight a thousand, since it's the Lord who fights for you just as he promised he would. Be careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. Now, this, this third point of devoting ourselves, he breaks down into three sub-points. The first, the first one of these uh, is to be very strong. To be very strong, verse 6. Therefore, he says, be very strong. Now, th this phrase, it's, it's come up over and over in the series, and we saw that in um, Moses' speech in Deuteronomy 31. Again, over and over. Um, if you go back to Joshua 1, actually go there with me. Joshua 1, verse 6, he says, Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land. Verse 7, Be strong and very courageous, being careful to do all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from it 
to the left or to the right, over and over. Verse 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. What he's doing is he's passing along again the wisdom that's been passed on to him, the thing that's kept him on the straight and narrow for his whole life. He's passing on. Be strong. Be strong and courageous. And it tells us a couple things. One, it's going to require strength, and strength comes through repetition, so we need to, we need to be strong, and we need to count on having to keep coming back to this. But there's something else uh, hidden in the, the Hebrew for this word strong. Uh, and it speaks more to the idea of resolve than aptitude. Here's what I mean by that. When he commands us to be strong, he's not saying never fail. Always just be ripped. What he's saying is be relentless. Keep getting up. And so if you're here and you failed and you're like, I'm not strong, I'm weak, you can still be strong if you get back up. If you keep pressing in, this is what's being communicated with this word strong. Be resilient. Be strong. Keep going. Keep getting back up. And then uh, Josh speaks in the text about the thing that would keep them from that. The thing that would keep them down. And that's the temptation of the nations around them. If you've read through uh, the rest of the Old Testament... The thing that ended actually up hindering Israel from fully taking possession of the land and actually led them away back into exile was the allure of the nations around them, right? They started to syncretize with the culture that was around them. They lost track of the promises of God. They forgot all that he'd done before and they settled for half of what God had. They got sucked in and they became part of everything around them and they lost their distinction. And this isn't just an, an Israelite problem. This is one I wrestle every day. If you're like me, you're wrestling this every day. Isn't Vancouver alluring? Isn't there so many things here that try to draw our attraction away? The promise of a bigger house, the allure of fashion, of careers, of exotic vacations, of new climbs, of being more fit, the allure of, man, the list is so long. I can't even keep up with it. So many things, every day, something new coming at me, trying to get me to trade my heavenly citizenship for an earthly one. Just cash in, take it now, Josh. How do we guard against this? Be strong. Keep getting back up. And then in verse 8, we see a second instruction, which is to cling to the Lord your God. Cling. Now my Bible, the ESV, it says cling. Yours might say something different, whether it's cleave or be loyal or keep going or be faithful. What's being communicated is this idea of being joined close together, very close together, of staying in close proximity. That's what's being communicated by cling. And this word in the Hebrew, staying very close. Now, if you're married, if um, you're getting married, your marriage will or has been through a season where, where things try to get in between you, where maybe you fall out of contact. We leave gaps between each other and things come in and they begin to take the, the place. They begin to wedge between. We start to devote more time to other things or even other people. The things that will pull us away, both in marriage and in our relationship with the Lord. The things that will pull us away are things that we've allowed to grow in space that we've provided. Things that will grow and will pull us apart are things that we've allowed to grow in space that we provide. Josh is calling us to cling. Cling together. And strong marriages, they're not accidents. They're results of... a of healthy patterns, prioritizing time together, communicating, praying together, date nights, going on family adventures, snuggling while you Netflix and chill at night. But a strong relationship with the Lord is very similar. It's not an accident. It's a result of good patterns, intentional patterns. Time spent in his word, time spent in prayer, time spent 
in silence and solitude, time spent serving the body around us, time spent using the gifts God's given us to build up the body of God and build out the body of God by going and sharing the gospel with those around us. This is how we, we stay close to the Lord, just like we do in a marriage relationship. This is how we cling. This is how we leave no gap. He, he calls him to be strong and to cling, and then in verse 11, we see his third instruction, to be very careful to love. Be very careful to love the Lord your God. And this word love here, it's a verb, just like love everywhere else in the Bible. It's a verb, meaning it's an action, it's a choice. And we, we live in a culture that tells us love is purely feeling. It's something that kind of overtakes us. We can't help. The love being spoken of here is something that we intentionally choose to continue to engage in. Love. If we want to fully participate in this life uh, Jesus offers in the relationship with the Father that he died to give us, we need to be continually living out these rhythms that you see on the screen here, reflecting on God's faithfulness. Spend time doing that. Remembering, putting before yourself, maybe writing on your door, putting a reminder in your phone, the promises that God has for you. And devoting ourselves to God by being very strong, getting back up, leaving no room for things to come between us and the Lord and being making the choice to intentionally love and pursue the Lord. And so I want to ask us, Westside, for another moment of honesty, if you will, um, just internally. Matt, you don't need to yell out this time. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you relate or how would you um, rate your relationship with the Lord right now? A scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your relationship with the Lord? Then let me ask have you, have you, have we, maybe even, where have you been leaving space for other things to get between? And let me ask, what patterns or what rhythms are we engaging with in order to strengthen this, rela- strengthen this relationship? Good questions to examine and, and to figure out how do we strengthen this relationship with the Lord? Joshua closes his speech off um, by warning them. A big warning. It took almost half of the the verses that we have this morning. Warning them about what will happen if they don't foster these patterns. And he says that if they stop remembering the goodness and kindness of God towards them, if they lose sight of the promises that are ahead, they become enticed by the pleasures and pursuits of the culture and the nations around them. It says... He will not drive the nations out. That's frightening. Verse 13, it says, there'll be a whip to their side and thorn to their eyes. No one wants thorns in their eyes. He's saying their experience moving forward is going gonna, gonna to be related to how they engage with the promises of God that are put in front of them. How much of the promised land they partake of will depend on how much they engage. Likewise, how much we partake of the promised life that Jesus has in front of us will depend on how purposefully we engage with it moving forward. And I want to be very careful. I'm very careful here. Um, I don't want anyone to misunderstand me. What I am not saying is that we earn our right standing before the Lord. I don't believe that. The Bible doesn't teach that. We are saved purely by grace and grace alone. Grace alone, Christ alone, in faith alone, to the glory of God alone. Saved by grace alone. I believe John 15, 16, when Jesus says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I didn't choose him. It's his grace alone that he chose a wretched sinner and drew him to himself. I believe Ephesians 2 when it says that I'm dead in my trespasses and sins and that I no more contributed to my salvation than Lazarus did to coming out of the tomb. I was dead I'm saved by grace alone. Please don't hear me saying that we contribute to our salvation. We do not. But Josh clearly articulates that Israel, um, pardon me, Josh clearly articulates Israel inherited the promised land solely because of God's grace. But he's also clear that their experience in the land 
is going to depend and be related some, some way to how they engage with God's promises moving forward. And likewise, our experience in this life that Christ has purchased for us and in the relationship with the Father that he's died to give us, it will correlate to our engagement with it. It'll correlate to the effort we put in. To quote Dallas Willard, um, I love Dallas Willard, got a bit of a man crush. He said, grace is opposed to earning, but not to effort. Grace is opposed to earning, not to effort. We don't earn our salvation. To try is futile. That's what every other religion in the world preaches, is that you keep this list of things and you earn for yourself a right standing. Christianity says you cannot. Jesus came and saved you by his own works. Now we live our life in joyful response to him. Grace is opposed to, effort, to earning, not to effort. In fact, God's grace actually empowers our effort. It multiplies it. It makes it possible. It makes it do what it could not do if, if he had not saved us. To, to illustrate this, Colossians 3.5, for those of us who are in Christ, uh, commands us to put to death what is earthly in us. We all know we cannot put to death the deeds of our flesh apart from the Spirit's power. But in Christ, the Holy Spirit actually empowers our efforts and therefore the Bible can give us all sorts of imperatives to be holy as I'm holy. Put to death the deeds of your flesh. The list is very long. Run the race. It's not telling us to earn. It's telling us that the Holy Spirit's waiting to, in a sense, and I'm going to fumble the word, but to partner with our effort and radically multiply it. Romans 8, this is up on the screen, Romans 8 and 12. Um, it commands effort. This is from the Berean Study Bible, another really good translation I like to use. I like how it puts it here. It says, therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to, to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. By the Spirit our efforts are met. So no one, this is saying, is going to be made holy without effort. Not holy in justified sense, but our ongoing sanctification and transformation into the image of Christ will include our effort. And this is, I think, what Augustine was getting at when he said, without him, we cannot. But without us, he won't. He wants to partner with us. He invites us into this mission together. So we inch towards a close. I want to invite you to flip with me to um, 2 Peter. 2 Peter 1, uh, verse 3 to 10. It's too long to put up on the screen, so I just want to flip there in your Bibles with me. I would commend this verse. There is so much here. It's speaking a lot. It's sort of the New Testament version, in a sense, of Joshua's speech to the Israelites, take this, go home with it, study it this week. Um, there is all sorts of gold nuggets to get out of this verse, but I just I want to read it. It says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness in Christ Jesus. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and, glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. There's that promise again. Joshua called the people to reflect on the promise. Now Peter does. So that through them, the promises, we may become partakers of the divine nature, that life Jesus came to give us having escaped the corruption that's in the world because of sinful desire. So for this very reason, make every effort. Make effort, engage, willfully choose to supplement your faith with virtue. Virtue, knowledge. These are actions on our part. Knowledge, self-control. Self-control, steadfastness. Steadfastness, godliness. And godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection, love. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, so if we're 
increasingly engaging in this, we will be kept from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever lacks these things is so nearsighted, he's blind. Having forgotten, he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will continually engage and continually transform us from one degree of glory to another. In this way, there will be provided for us richly entrance into the kingdom of our Lord and, Jesus, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Westside. There is in front of us an invitation to life eternal, to life abundant. There's an invitation to engage in a deeper capacity than we ever have before. There's an invitation to have as much of God as we want. I want us to want as much as we can get. So I asked us, on a scale of 1 to 10, where would you rate your relationship with the Lord at the moment? And regardless of whether you gave a, a 1 or a 3 or a 7 or a 9, the way you move this, one step or five, it begins in the same way, with a step. It begins by intentionally engaging with the promises he's put before us. Stepping into them, believing them, fixing our eyes on them. And believing that as we walk towards them, his spirit will empower us. His grace will empower us and multiply any meager effort that we could put in. Joshua called the people to reflect on his faithfulness, to fix their eyes on his promise, and to devote themselves to the Lord by being strong and resilient, by clinging to God and being careful to continue walking out an active verb form of love towards the Lord. And the same call exists for us. And as we do, we can trust that God is going to meet us, the Holy Spirit's going to empower us, and that we're going to begin to become partakers of more life than we've ever thought possible or been experiencing up until now. Westside, the invitation is to life, life more abundant life overflowing, and it's available to us today. We're going to close um, by responding in a few ways. We're going to have communion servers up on the sides, and we're, as you come forward and just remember all that Christ has accomplished for us, all that he died to give us, the right relationship with the Father and eternal life that he came to give us, we're going to remember what it cost, Christ's death, the bread symbolizing his body and the wine symbolizing his blood. And as the bread absorbs the wine, remember that Jesus Christ absorbed all the wrath of God that was reserved towards us. If you're not a believer, and this life sounds enticing, maybe you've been living life mediocre. For whatever reason, you ended up here this morning. It's because Jesus wants to give you life. So you could turn and talk to the person who brought you. If you came alone, come find me. I want to talk to you about what what that means, what it means to step forward and begin to become a partaker of this life. You could go see the prayer team in the corner with any prayer requests you have. I just ask that if you decide to give your life to Christ, if you want to partake of this life today, put, um, grab a prayer card on your way out and write, I decided to follow Jesus. We want to know, we want to walk with you, we want to disciple you into the next steps. And then someone will be up on the back end with a little bit more instruction. But I said, let me close this in prayer. Now, Father, I... I thank you for sending your son to rescue us from bondage, to free us to not just to promise land, but to free us to promise life, life abundant. You know all the ways, Holy Spirit, that we fall into life mediocre here in this city. And I pray that you'd quicken our senses so that we would remember, we'd remember and we would see all that you've put in front of us. I want to become a deeper partaker of that. So Holy Spirit, would you come and minister in my heart, in our hearts this morning. Show us what you're calling us forward into. Wow us with the grace, your lavish grace on us that, that offers an invitation such as this. We commit this all to you, Father, in the name of Christ. Amen.